Hello and welcome to this very special episode of Seven Days of Worm Science. It's also Seven Days of Christmas Science, so we're combining the two in a wormy, Christmassy mess. I think. Not really sure what's going to happen, really. This is all uncharted territory for humanity. What happened to the decorations? Starting off the news this week, something that I'm sure many of you have already heard about, not least because it actually happened last week. So last Wednesday, the Parker Solar Probe briefly dipped into the corona of our sun, the very upper parts of its atmosphere. So this little tiny craft built by NASA and launched back in 2018 has touched the sun. Interestingly, we reported back on the Parker Solar Probe all the way back in our 2018 Halloween special, when it broke the then record for getting close to our sun, and mentioned how one day it'll actually touch it. And that day has come. Anyway, what's the point in all this? Well, by getting closer to the sun than anything has done before, the Parker Solar Probe is able to gather new and unique information into how the sun works, as it gets in and out of the sun as quick as it can while taking readings, flying through at a colossal 320,000 miles an hour. One of the ways that this information about our sun will be directly useful and relevant to us is allowing scientists to understand potentially threatening events like solar storms, so they can be adequately prepared for. In other more wormy news now, Dorset Council has reported that it may cost over £15,000 to move a group of slow worms from an area where they seek to build new homes. That's over £750 per w Slow worms aren't worms. I'll try and find something else. An interesting study was published this week that investigated the anatomical differences between slow worm species across regions in Europe where they coexist. Okay, well, we know slow worms aren't actually considered worms in the general sense, but then again, there is no real scientific definition of what a worm is, so now that we've found two stories with worms, we're just going to go with this one. Anyway, this paper explains how in the past it was thought that only one or two species of the legless lizards known as slow worms existed, but more recent genetic analysis revealed that there are in fact five alive today. The study therefore sampled over 300 individuals from two of these species across Central Europe where their ranges overlap to try and determine if physical anatomical differences could be measured between them. The results found that they could indeed be grouped into two distinct morphologies, with one species having a less robust head, fewer scales, different coloration and other aspects that distinguished it from the other. It's an interesting bit of research that backs up the genetic evidence for the separation of slow worms into different species and has interesting implications for why these anatomical differences arose in their evolutionary history. Just before we move on, I want to quickly mention that the James Webb Telescope, dubbed as Hubble's successor, will be launching on Saturday, so tune into that if you manage to grab some time on Christmas Day. I'll go into more detail about the telescope next week once it's actually launched. Hopefully. And now over to Ben, who, very excitingly, is going to tell you more about worms. But also not worms. Thanks, Doug. Also in the sort of worm news is an exciting paper reporting the largest ever fossil of the extinct giant millipede Arthropleura. Now, I know a millipede isn't exactly a worm, but again there's not really a proper definition of what a worm is. Plus, Arthropleura looks a lot more wormy than some things people do call worms, and there's even an entire group of millipedes called the worm-like millipedes, the helminthomorphs, so we're going to go with it. Anyway, this is an incredibly remarkable discovery, being found in northern England and actually giving us a lot of new information on this amazing animal. Not only is it the largest Arthropleura fossil found, but also the earliest body fossil evidence of gigantism in this millipede, and the first time that an Arthropleurid body fossil has been found in the same region and sedimentary succession as the arthropod trackway Diplochnites coethensis, strongly suggesting that these footprints were made by these massive millipedes. The fossil itself preserves between 12 and 14 segments and is a molted exoskeleton that was shed by the millipede as it grew. The full Arthropleura individual it belongs to is estimated to have been 55 centimetres wide and an astonishing 2.63 metres in length, with a weight of about 50 kilograms. In addition to other evidence, this new find supports the idea that Arthropleura lived in open woody habitats, not swamps, was restricted to environments near the equator, grew to enormous sizes before the atmospheric oxygen levels rose in the late Paleozoic, and was unaffected by the climatic events in the late Carboniferous period. 
only dying out in the early Permian. It's a really awesome discovery, it's great to have more fossil material of this absolutely amazing animal. Next, we have another fascinating paper on sauropod dinosaurs that's less worm related. Although I guess you could say that sauropods are just worms with massive bodies and four legs. They have long necks and tails. Yeah, okay, I won't try and justify that. This new research has analysed the biogeographical distribution of different dinosaur groups throughout the Mesozoic era, pointing out something quite peculiar about how these animals were spread out. Combining where fossils of dinosaurs have been found with data on past climates, they realised that sauropod dinosaurs only occupied habitats with high temperatures, and were strongly bounded by the lowest temperatures of an environment. This meant that their distribution favoured tropical areas, and they in fact never or rarely occurred in very high latitudes, especially in the northern hemisphere. The paper suggests that the wider availability of suitable habitats for these dinosaurs in the southern hemisphere could explain why they were particularly diverse here compared to the north, especially in the late Cretaceous. The fact that the range of sauropods was more sensitive to the temperature of a region compared to the Ornithischian and Theropod dinosaurs could therefore indicate that there were thermophysiological differences between these dinosaur groupings, with sauropods perhaps being more ectothermic than the other clades. It's a really interesting paper that gives us a lot to think about, and the physiological possibilities raised by the study are fascinating. Also in the paleontology news is the announcement of a new dromaeosaur dinosaur from the Isle of Wight in England. Named Vectiraptor greeneye, this animal comes from fossils found in the Beremian-aged Wessex Formation, the same formation that the two recently described Spinosaurs come from. Not much material is known for Vectiraptor, with just two highly weathered dorsal vertebrae and a partial sacrum having been found, but it's enough to show that it's definitely different from any of the other theropods known from the Isle of Wight. Plus it displays many features that are consistent with a dromaeosaurid identification, more specifically the larger-bodied eudromaeosaurs. Additionally, the similarity of certain characters to early Cretaceous eudromaeosaurs in North America indicates a faunal exchange between these two continents, with a paper explaining how Europe essentially acted as a crossroads for faunal interchanges between the landmasses of Asia, North America and West Gondwana, resulting in the diverse dinosaur assemblage found here during this time in Earth's history. It's another exciting discovery from the Isle of Wight that once again shows how important this place is for paleontology, and the implications of finding a new dromaeosaur here are highly intriguing. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this year's Seven Days of Christmas Worm Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next week for the 200th episode of Seven Days of Science. Merry Christmas. <laughs>